everybody. Today we are debating creation evolution. Where does the evidence lead? And we are starting right now. Ladies and gentlemen, thrilled to have you here for another epic debate as today we will be debating creation evolution, where does the evidence point, and it's going to be a huge one folks. We are thrilled as we have two veteran speakers with us today. I want to let you know a few things up front as we are really thankful for so many people helping us put this event on. First, we want to say Artistic Encounter is a tattoo parlor here in Deep Ellum in Dallas and they have been so generous to let us use their facility without asking anything in return. So we really appreciate their help in allowing this event to happen and want to let you know, so if you're considering a tattoo, I can let you know they have a variety of artists who can do a lot of different things. So no matter what you're considering, this is the place to check out. It's Artistic Encounter in Deep Alum. And again, we want to say special thanks to them. Also, huge thanks to our speakers, as we have RN Ra with us and Dr. Mick Leroy. Thank you both very much for being here. And we have their links in the description of this video. So if you're listening and you're like, I love this, this is great, I wanna hear more from him. Well, good news, you can click just in that description box below and find their links there to hear more. So with that, I wanna let you know kind of what the loose format is for today. Basically, it's a roughly five to 10, maybe 12 at the most opening kind of, you could say, position statement. Just saying where they stand on this issue and then it's really just open dialogue. So that'll be for about 50 minutes, kind of open conversation followed by a short Q&A. And with that, I wanna let you know if you do have a question, feel free to fire that question into the live chat. We'll be trying to pull out as many questions as we can and asking them during the Q&A at the end of the discussion section. So, it's a true pleasure to have our speakers here today. So, Dr. McLeroy is going to start out making his opening position statement, and from there we'll go to Aaron and then the open discussion. So thank you, Dr. McLeroy, for being here. Well, <clears throat> thank you very much, James. It's a, it's a pleasure to be invited. I uh, was thinking about what my opening statement would be. I want you all to think about two things. I represent One Direction, Aaron represents a different direction. I'll let him present his. But my direction is, the, what I believe is that, I think about how we got here. I believe that in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And then he created man in his image. And in, uh, soon thereafter, Adam and Eve, they sinned. And that explains kind of how we got here, ultimately. Temporally, how did I get to be here debating about creation and evolution. Well, I'd like to quickly explain. This morning I taught my little fourth grade Sunday school class, 32nd year that I've been teaching. I love to uh, teach my Sunday school, little fourth graders. Those fourth graders, as soon as class was over, I drove up from Bryan College Station and came up here to Dallas. The, I grew up here in Dallas, went to Dallas Hillcrest, graduated in 1964, then I went to Texas A&M, graduated 68, I, after being in the Army for a couple of years, I had the GI Bill and I went back to school and I went to dental school down in Houston. And while I was in dental school in Houston, that's where I put my trust in Jesus. I became a Christian. I, also at that time, I became a what you would commonly hear referred to as a young earth creationist at that same time. And then for the last 42 years, I have been an avid reader of creation and evolution literature and thinking about it. But that doesn't explain why I'm here today. The reason I was invited was because in 1999, I was elected to the Texas State Board of Education. And while I was on the board, after 10 years in 2009, the board adopted new science standards here in Texas. They call them the TEKS, the Texas Essential Knowledge and Skills. And at that time, we adopted science standards in March 2009. Those new science standards is why, ultimately, why I got here. Now, what I was going to... We adopted them the next week in Science Magazine. They carried a story about the new standards. And to quote, it says, new science standards for Texas schools strike a major blow to the teaching of evolution. Whoa, that's the lead sentence from Science Magazine, April 3rd, 2009. 
in there they have some quotes where they talk about, uh, and I, they even interviewed me, and I was able to say, I think the new standards are wonderful. I said, uh, and then it says, an evaluation of the sudden appearance of fossils and explanation of stasis in the fossil record is, is one of the things we got included. And also, I was excited about the fact that the students would learn about unguided natural processes trying to explain the complexity of the cell. Well, this lady, Eugenie Scott, who's real big in the evolution uh, circles, and she's retired from the National Center for Science Education, she said, moderates on the board may have failed to recognize the final amendments as intelligent design talking points. So I think it's very important to remember that Science Magazine, one of the most reputable magazines in science uh, in the world, had a story about it, what happened. Well, two months later, in June, they had another story about what we did. Uh, so you just don't get two stories in Science Magazine about something like this unless it's a big story. And there, they interviewed this Kenneth Miller. Kenneth Miller uh, is a very well-known Christian Catholic uh, evolutionist, and he is one of the authors of one of the most important, uh, he and this uh, Levine are, have one of the most popular biology books for high school students. He said, the new standards for Texas leave plenty of room for the authors to explain the robustness of evolutionary theory. So he got real excited about the fact that we're gonna have uh, a chance to show the robustness. He said, the advocates of these standards underestimate the strength of the scientific evidence for the structure and phenomena that they mistakenly believe evolution cannot account for. Miller says, the new wording is an opportunity to make biology text even stronger. For example, Miller intends to introduce more material on the evolution of organelles within the cell to show the cell's complexity is in fact explained by evolution. And uh, when I was asked about that in this article, I also said that I was satisfied that more scientific evolutionary discussions will serve the students well. Because I made a prediction that the explanations offered in the text will be so weak that the students who are skeptical of evolution will see the weaknesses for themselves. So, like I said, it's a pretty major story. Well, now I'd like to go along, and just to be uh, fair, that was in 2009. In 2014, if you want to refer to that as I go through it, in 2014, uh, well, actually, 2012, the Fordham Institute did an analysis of all the state science standards, and they really criticized all the standards throughout the nation, but I'd like to read what they had to say about uh, Texas high school standards. Remember, this is uh, three years later, and this is from the Fordham Institute, and they criticize evolution standards throughout the nation. But here's what they said about Texas. Uh, they acknowledged that the controversial high school evolution standards were described as exemplary. You remember, Eugenie Scott referred to these as a and intelligent design talking points. Steve Newton, also with the National Center for Science Education, said the board's actions, this is at the time they were adopted, are the most specific assault I've seen against the teaching of evolution in modern science. Let's be clear, this is Eugenie Scott again. This is a setback for science education in Texas, not a draw, not a victory. Even the American Association of Advancement of Science noted creationist notch win in Texas showdown. However, when you get to the details of the Fordham report, it says the standards handled the subject straightforward. And then it listed the standards. So, uh, which was it? Did we attack evolution? The most interesting thing is, if creationists try to insert creationism into any standard anywhere, guess what happens? They get struck down as uh, you know, unconstitutional because you can't teach creationism. Even though we had a majority to get some good, strong science standards, they were not creationists and our intelligence design talking points, or the other side could have challenged him in court and said, oh, you're, you're, so. Then we're gonna go back to Miller and Levine. Kenneth Miller, in 2014, and I gave a copy of this to Aaron, he can, RN, he can follow along with me. Uh, they had an assignment in their book that was adopted in 2014, and I was for all the textbooks to be adopted once these books came out because at the time I said they'll have to explain the sudden appearance and stasis in the fossil record. They'll have to explain how the cell got its complexity. I said this is great. That's all I want. That's all we wanted. Well, in Kenneth Miller and Levine's book, 
in 2014, biology, it says they had an assignment, the history of life, and I have assignment for students to think critically and evaluate the evolutionary origin of ribosomes. And here's what they had in their book. Evaluate scientific explanations concerning the complexity of the cell, ribosomes, which are composed of RNA and proteins and are part of the complex structure of cells. One hypothesis proposes that the, proposes that the earliest cells may have produced proteins using RNA alone, and that ribosome proteins were added gradually. Evaluate the proposed explanation of the evolutionary ribosomes based on the evidence that has been presented to support it. Ah, this is exactly, when I saw this in the Miller Levine book, I was ecstatic. And this is exactly what, I can't wait to see if my prediction was that the evidence would be weak. As you can see, here's a picture of the ribosomes in color in their, that they had in their textbook. This is from their textbook. And in this, they said ribosomes consist of four ribosomal RNA molecules, more than 80 different proteins. The origin of this complex structure has long been a mystery. New research, however, has led to some surprising findings. Okay, here is the evidence that they give in the textbook for our Texas students. One of these is that part of the ribosome, where the, the part of the ribosome where the chemical bonds are formed between amino acids completely lacks proteins. This is true of other key places in the ribosome as well. So it's now clear that ribosomal RNA itself carries out the most important task in protein synthesis. How should we understand and evaluate this surprising fact? One interpretation supported by the evidence is that the earliest cells may have, they're hedging their bets, produced proteins using RNA alone. That over time, proteins were added to the RNA in ways that improved the efficiency of the process leading to today's more complex ribosomes. So, if you're a student, they said, let's tackle the assignment presented by Miller and Levine to evaluate proposed explanation for the evolution of ribosomes based on the evidence presented to support it. Well, what was the evidence they presided? They said, well, most of the action takes place with RNA molecules alone, but no proteins are involved. So here are some of the questions that could be asked. Are there any cells anywhere today that do not have proteins? No. Can you have life as we know it without proteins? No. Are there any proteins anywhere in the living cell today that was not made by a ribosome? No. Therefore, but if you have life today as we know it, but can you have life today as we have know it without ribosomes? No. Yes. Okay, that's, that's where you get to respond in a second. Is there any pure RNA only molecular machine that makes proteins today? No. Do they have evidence that it ever existed? No. Would actual evidence of RNA only ribosomes be better than speculating that the er earliest cells may have produced RNA? So, how robust is, robust is the single surprising fact they provide that ribosome well, RNA carries out the most important task in protein synthesis? Does it explain the origin of the ribosome? No. Does it explain how it became incorporated with more than 80 different proteins? No. Does it explain the origin of the original four RNAs? No. Does it explain how they were formed? Does it explain how they were joined together? Does it explain how the messenger RNA with the coded instructions found them once they were joined together? Does it explain how they were able to reproduce themselves? No, no, no. Were all the 80 proteins in the ribosome made by the ribosome? Yes. That's what I would think. Do they know which of the 80 ribosomal proteins were added first, or second, or third, or so on? Can they add an extra protein today to further improve the efficiency of the process? No. Do they know the function of the ribosomal, pro ribosomal proteins? Is it a frame? Is it a support structure? A chassis? Can you make a support structure out of pure RNA? Can RNA without protein support itself and make another protein? They don't know. If not, how can you have a ribosome without a protein? And how can you have a protein without a ribosome? Consider an automobile. Can you say that the engine carries out the most important task? How plausible is it then to conclude that the engine gradually added a chassis that improved the efficiency of the process, leading to today's more complex automobile? Anyway, the strange analogies that don't hold me too hard on those analogies. But bottom line is, there is a lot of complexity, and right this picture that they have in their book is from what's called a prokaryote or, or you know, ribosome, which means it's the earliest cells before eukaryotes like us. Therefore, this goes way back 
I checked to see what I could find. But ribosomal, uh, ribosomes have been around for almost since life started. But they didn't start with the first cell, way too complex for, to have started on the very first cell, from my point of view. Therefore, it had evolution would then have to account for it. Because evolution, I'm not gonna, doesn't, uh, it accounts for life changing after it got started. But anyway, so that's my challenge on the complexity of the cell. That's why I was uh, excited to see how the textbooks would handle it. I predicted they wouldn't handle it very well, and to me it looks very weak. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. McLeroy. So with that, we're going to kick it over to Arn Ra for his opening position statement, and want to let you know whether you be take the position of creation or evolution, we hope you feel welcome here. Consider hitting that subscribe button as we have a lot more debates coming up. In case you want reminders, hit that little notification bell next to the subscribe button. And with that, we will go to Arn for his uh, roughly, you know, five to ten opening minutes, uh, opening statement. And so, Aaron, thanks so much again for being here, and the floor is all yours. Thank you. I, uh, I was told that this was going to be a discussion about evolution. I should have predicted that we weren't going to get anywhere near evolution. We were going to talk about abiogenesis the entire time instead. But that's just one of the frauds, falsehoods, and fallacies that you get with creationism. Now, I, I can present an explanation for synthetic proteins and for abiogenesis and to show you a distinction between ribosomes and prokaryotes because they are nowhere near the same thing, but put all that aside for the moment. The reason that I became an activist, the reason that I got involved, this is much, you know, much because of you, uh, I, I was working uh, in, a, in, a, in an area where I was able to do an un, unprecedented amount of research. I'm sitting in front of a computer all day, I've got unlimited overtime, and all I'm doing is studying all the time. And I find myself in uh, discussion groups with uh, various theologians and scientists and so forth. And they're both, uh, both sides encouraging me to read this, read that, read this. So for several years, I was on this steep learning curve and I got active in it when I saw, when, when a number of Christians were bragging to me about how their churches had all illegally voted as a lobby exactly as their ministers have told them to do in order to place certain judges and senators and school board members and so forth in order to uh, enact what they were calling a culture war that I was not even aware of was going on. So what they wanted to do was to position all of these evangelical friendly judges and senators and so forth so that when a trial would eventually come where somebody's going to challenge evolution, they would have the judges for, you know, religiously biased and that they would get what they want taught in school. They wanted to undermine not just evolution. Creationism is a rejection of evolution specifically, but more generally, it's, a, it's uh, undermining, or it's a, it, uh, creationism is a rejection of methodolog methodological naturalism. They don't want to have things that can only be tested to be verified. They want to use magic, literally, the supernatural. Supernatural equals magic, magic equals miracle equals supernatural. They're all the same thing. So they wanted to have magic apply as a scientific explanation in science. And they wanted to challenge people's understanding of science because, in, and this was later revealed, but after this time, it was later revealed by the Discovery Institute in what they called the wedge document, the wedge strategy, was to cause people to question evolution, put out enough misinformation to mislead people so that they don't understand what evolution is, and then they can use the fallacy of the god of the gaps which is, if you don't know that science has an explanation in it, therefore magic. So whatever we don't know, and he expressed this in his description, as all creationists do, you can't explain this, therefore magic, therefore God. So that is a completely dishonest position. And what really got to me was how they were misleading students in school. Now, it's, it's one thing to lie to your own children. Sadly, you have, a, you have a right to do that. But you should not ever be allowed to lie to other people's kids in a sequestered classroom where the teacher is supposed to be the authority and is supposed to be imparting the information. At that time, I was very naive, and I thought that when I heard statements from McLeroy and a number of others, you know, like Terry Leo was a chair, what, chairman of the board at one point, and she said that, uh, you know, that she didn't know what a theory was. She thought that there was a law of gravity and that theories were like hypotheses. She could, she's on the board of education, and she doesn't know what a theory is, right? Which essentially, essentially you, can, you can look at it from a colloquial or common perspective. You can look at a theory in modern terms as being a, a hypothesis that has been essentially proven beyond reasonable doubt with uh, uh, overwhelming preponderance of evidence because it's been tested so many times and vindicated every time and never being contradicted once. It elevates to the position of theory, which is the highest level of confidence that science can achieve. And every theory is a body of knowledge or a field of study that explains a given phenomenon. 
Board of Education didn't want to take, to teach that because they want to teach that evolution is just a theory, which makes no sense in science. I mean, uh, atomic theory is just a theory, so I guess we don't really know if atomic bombs work. The cell theory of disease, again, just a theory, right? Germ theory, I'm sorry, germ theory of disease and cell theory. Compare those. We know that germs, or germs, or you know, pathogens, cause illness. This is a fact. Every modern scientific theory is also a fact. And the National Academy of Science also declares that evolution is a fact in the same sense. And in another sense, too, because it is so well supported that there's no, there's no body of evidence that's ever going to stand against it. He comes in and says, well, well, this explanation is weak, but I believe in talking snakes and magic spells and golem spells where a man is made out of mud and then magically enchanted. That's a golem spell. So he's believing in myths and magic and fairy tales, literally, because a fairy tale is a, is a fable with a moral that involves talking animals, magic spells, witches, wizards, dragons, that sort of thing. And that's, that's, that's what creationism is, right? That's what Genesis is. There's absolutely not one word of truth to it, but there are a hell of a lot of lies. And that's the problem. They are lying to kids in school, trying their best to mislead them. You may remember, I tried to get you involved in a debate when I first got, found out who you were, and there was another guy that was working with you, Mark Ramsey. And we tried to arrange an online debate so that I could bring you and Terry Leo into it. And I get this guy, Mark Ramsey, who admits on a moderated debate, in writing, that he knows that transitional species exist in the fossil record, but he wants to teach children that there are none because it's important that they believe there are none. So what is the truth? From my perspective, the truth is what the facts are, what we can show to be true, not whatever we want to assert that we want to make believe. So facts equal truth, especially empirical facts. That's the, that's the facts that we can verify, that we, you know, we know this is the truth, this has been proven to be the truth. This guy mentioned that he teaches fourth graders. He told his fourth grade class to keep chipping away at that empirical evidence. Keep chipping away at the truth that has been verified. He does not want them to believe in truth. He doesn't want them to understand what facts are. He wants to tell them something else. And he wants to rely, oh, well, science can't explain this, or he doesn't know what science is, or he doesn't understand the explanation that science gave. Therefore, God, therefore his book of fairy tales, which we have conclusively disproved on every point. We know that there was no Adam and Eve. Other Christians are declaring this now. Francis Collins was the director of the, of the Human Genome Project. He announced there cannot be an Adam and Eve. Genetically, it's impossible. They did not exist. We know the Tower of Babel didn't happen. We know what really happened and what it's based on, likely. Uh, we know that the, the global flood of Noah's Ark did not happen. I've got an eight-part eight video series explaining the different ways, the different types of science that proves that that never happened. We know that the Exodus never happened. We know that none of that stuff really happened. And we know that there's an awful lot of previous fables from polytheism that a lot of that stuff is based on. Moses, for example, is based on like four or five different characters that all ex that. that some real characters that existed like a thousand years or five hundred years earlier than the time normally ascribed to Moses. So there's no truth at all. And he says, he says, our explanation is weak. He has none. I don't know, therefore magic is not an explanation. Misleading children. If you're the Board of Education and you say that these great science standards, how come you don't know what evolution is? And I think I'll stop with that. Thank you very much. We'll go into the open conversation now. So the floor is yours, gentlemen. So I can say what I want? Yes. Well, I, I kind of missed how you attacked what I had said. I was looking at the evidence. I'd asked for evidence. I went to a science uh, biology book that was written for our Texas students. I went right to the section. I read from the section where they had this description of how a ribosome and how much evidence there is to support these organelles, these very complex things. The ribosome goes way back, supposedly four billion, I mean, goes all the way back to uh, like the first life. There were ribosomes, evidently, you can trace it back to it the back last further. universal common ancestor, which is the- It goes know, who, back further than that. Okay, well, it's got to at least go back to the last universal common ancestor, ribosomes. It is not part of abiogenesis, you, you, unless you yes, can have something- is. Okay, well then we disagree, so we'll just... Uh, you have to have you, ribosomes before you can have a prokaryote. They're not the same thing. Uh, I, and well, like you said, of course it's not the same thing. The prokaryote's the whole... This is just an organelle inside. No, of, it's it, not. And, anyway, so... A prokaryote is an independent life form. Yes, 
Yes, a ribosome is just a cell organelle. It's just part of that was that ribosome is only a portion of the You still need the components before you can build the whole. So, uh, okay, well, I'd like to know how, how we got here. It's, a, it's interesting that he you. can, well, I'd like to hear that the next show evidence for anything because you want to see. <clears throat> But we're going to be I'm going to be talking about evolution more often. Well, I, that's yeah. where I plan on going. I was talking about evolution from my perspective. This is, the nope. ribosome is not touched on it yet. Okay. Well, I've technically, touched on evolution it. is descent with inherent modification. It's a, it's a genetic descent, so you have to have an ancestor parent relationship. And yes, when we're, we're talking about abiogenesis, we're talking about way too much going on horizontally in order to identify an ancestor parent descent uh, relationship. Okay. You don't get that until we begin with eukaryotes. And I'm. There was no life until there was a ribosome, is your position. Okay, I know. No, that's not what I said. I well, said there were ribosomes before there were life. There were ribosomes before there were life. Okay. So, okay, okay. okay. Well, let's just grant that. It's very complex. I just want to grant the complexity of the cell. And we will get to evolution, and that's the only abiogenesis. I never would have considered that as part of it. But anyway, uh, so as far as uh, theology, so far, I mentioned that I believe in the beginning God created heaven and earth. It's the most reasonable explanation. That's what I would like for people to, to come away from this. When we get finished discuss, with our discussion, with our debate today, I'd like you to consider which is the most reasonable explanation, our ends or mine, okay? And I think uh, I am convinced that uh, I have more evidence, more support for the fact that uh, God creating is the most... I Reasonable guarantee position. you don't have fact one that implies that. You have no evidence whatsoever, and you're ignoring all the evidence I can present. You literally have nothing. I've spent more than 20 years arguing with creationists about their evidence. They haven't got it ever, and you've never been able to present it either. You have a book of fairy tales, and that's what you believe, and that's it, and that's all. Reasonable would mean that we have a reason to imply that. Now, we know that evolution happens. We can observe it, we can document it. Not just microevolution, either macroevolution has been directly observed and documented both in the lab and in naturally controlled conditions of the field dozens of times. We have phylogeny confirmed genetically and through fossils and through morphology. We have every kind of evidence you'd ever want to name, but we don't have the book of fables. Sorry, that's the one thing we don't have. You don't have we, the book of what? We don't have the book of fables. Another thing we don't have, and this is important, we cannot say that something is true unless we have evidence that it is true. Faith is all about asserting baseless speculation as though it were true, which is dishonest. We can't say that something is even possible unless we have a precedent or parallel or verified phenomenon indicating that possibility. So when we've determined that something is possible, we can then say that we might, because there are many things that are not possible, we can't just say that everything is. But there's lots of things that are not possible. Before we can say it's possible, we have to be able to show the possibility exists. And so when we show, we, we, in science, we don't want to say ever, we don't want to close the door on anything. But we've identified a possibility, this, this is how that could have happened. We have a path of development that, that all of these things line up. This is the way it likely is. You have to be honest and say that it may be that, if it may be that. You don't ever want to assert as fact what you cannot show, which is what creationism is all about. Asserting things that are not so, that are not even possible, and just stating them as over a fact. Again, okay, did we put evolution, did we put, did we put creationism in the standards? What you did was to try to challenge it with your weaknesses of evolution, all of which were misrepresented, by the way, and I've done a series of videos about that. And again, like I said, when, when we had the, the, the... Yes or no, did we put... Creation is in our state standards. Intelligent design stock talking points in there, which more, a number of people didn't recognize because if they're not used to dealing with, if they're used to dealing with scientists exclusively, then they're used to dealing with people that have like honest credentials and sincerity. If you're dealing with creationists, then you're dealing with flim flam men and salespersons. Okay. I would like to read what was passed by the board in 2009, and you tell me if this is an intelligent design talking point. This, this is the crucial standards. Analyze and evaluate scientific explanations concerning any data of sudden appearance, stasis, and sequential nature of groups in the fossil record. 
No. Or is that any intel is there an is that an intelligent design talking point? That one I did not notice an intelligent design talking point. Okay. But the way things are worded are very carefully worded so it allow <coughs> in creationist arguments in there. Okay, here's the other possible. One. Like when you talk about thinking critically about evolution, where we would not challenge kids to think critically about any other avenue of science, or certainly not about history either, blindly believe what we tell you about everything else, but think critically about evolution exclusively. Just be critical about that. Can you get the reset on the camera over there? Get the button that says start, stop. Thank you. Okay. The second standard that we put in the evolution section, as you can see, this is added to the evolutionary standard of our high school biology. It's take number seven. The student knows evolutionary theory is a scientific explanation for the unity and diversity of life the student is expected to, and B was the one I just read about sudden appearance, stasis, and sequential nature of groups in the fossil record. Mm -hmm. She was added also. It's the second big amendment that I proposed and was adopted. The final wording says, analyze and evaluate scientific explanations concerning the complexity of the cell. Yeah, and that's it. Is that an intelligent design? As talking? a fourth grader, you're supposed to analyze and evaluate what is being taught to you by qualified professionals, whereas you wouldn't have to challenge that for anything else. So Interesting. This is ninth grade biology. And it okay. Was, well, you were teaching fourth grade before. Oh, uh, yeah, but I'm talking about the so science. So, in a televised interview on ABC News, you admitted by acknowledging the affirmative that your intention as an elected official was to impose your own religious and political views on other people's children. Do you remember that interview? Uh, no, I don't. In one of your publications, you said that, no, wait, uh, you said that the important aspect of Darwinian evolution is its naturalistic claim that all life is a result of purposeless, unintelligent material causes. But in fact, there is not a scientist that ever said that, is there? I don't remember saying that. Well, yeah, I no, have you don't usually remember, but it's in 99% right. of the time. In another public statement. Talk, well, I'll tell you what I in another public statement, you said that most of the books we are considering adopting claim that nothing made a spider out of a rock. Not one science book ever declared anything similar to that. Or well, that any true. reasonable person could could. I, re I remember asked. making a comment about a spider and coming out of the rock. I think that was back in 2003, so that's... Uh, I, I, I was better than that when I was eight, and you're, on, you're the chairman of the Board of Education. Well, and you're making statements like that. Oh, I wasn't at that time, but I, I was a member of the board. It's fine. The uh, where did spiders come from? Spiders are are arachnids, and I I would contest that they originated in Eurypterida, but we still need the fossil identification for that. We know phylogenetically where they were placed. Nothing ever came from a rock, except in creationism, where Golem was where, where Adam was created as a Golem spell, and even rabbinical scholars agree with that. But nothing ever came from a rock. Evolution does not and never did teach that anything came from a rock. Because a rock is a solid, it's a rock is minerals made up of, of crystalline structures, does not apply to anything in evolution. Most of the early life forms didn't even have minerals in them. So that is a gross deliberate distortion based on Kent Hovind, I would like a convicted fraud. Okay. I know I didn't get that from Mr. Hovind. Now here's my question. Wouldn't matter how where did, you got it from. How, didn't did get we, it from a scientist. how did how, how did we get here? How did we arrive? How did we get to this spot? You said you could tell me how you got here, then I could respond better. Well, I, I don't think you can. I did a forty seven it's up to forty seven episodes right now for the uh, systematic classification well, of life. Can't you summarize it, please? Oh yeah, yeah. You you say give me give me uh, everything we know about molecules to man right now in a tweet. I'm sorry, there's a little bit too much there. Well, where, so did the matter you agree? Come from? where did the matter come from? Where did the matter come from? Yes, there's a well, matter again, here. We, we were supposed to be talking about evolution, and now you want to be talking about... And what was the other part of creation? What, what, uh, creation implies a creator. We were talk, yeah, yeah, but we don't want to assume things that aren't evident. So you asked me where we came from, where we came from. Now you want to know where the matter came from. Are we talking about evolution, which is an aspect of biology? Or do you want to go into uh, stellar nuclear th synthesis? Well, rock is a matter. I'm just going to go back... The complexity of life is not an argument for God. That's important to state. I make. agree because Our God is the simplest and most childish excuse men ever made up for things they couldn't understand, and that's why that answer has always been wrong. We used to think that comets were an omen. We used to think that, that diseases were witchcraft. We used to think that uh, epilepsy was demonic possession. All of that, and every time we were not satisfied with the supernatural explanation, we saw the real answer. It turned out to be a revelation of whole new fields of study, previously unimagined and vastly more complex than our original excuses about magic and physical men casting magic spells. And so it always will be. If we ever discover the origin of the universe, 
It won't be God, because it's never been God. That's always been the wrongest answer. Okay, so I don't know how to respond when you said this. Well, go ahead. I mean, the, the, the quote about the rock, the spiders, is pretty interesting. Oh, I know we I know that there's more. spiders today, and if you go further back in time, if there was an origin of life, you would have just plain... Where Matter spiders divide from us is when we split. We went to deuterostomes and they went to protostomes. Well, I can tell us from a spider. I can tell the difference. Well, maybe. The difference between us, our, our last common ancestor would have been in the division between protostomes and deuterostomes. The difference being that in a protostome, the, uh, the, the blastopore opens a hole that eventually connects from the anus to the mouth. Now, in a protostome, it starts mouth first and goes to anus, but in a deuterostome, it starts anus first and goes to mouth, and it's the first thing that forms, which means that there's a stage in our development when we are literally nothing but an asshole. I wrote a book called Foundational Falses of Creationism. It sold really well, and your name is mentioned in it a bunch, and this is where I got a lot of these quotes from, and I'm sparing you by not going in all of them. Okay. If you look at the evidence that is for uh, the, you know, we're talking about life. Life is present on the planet. Start off with an early, simple life. Do you believe it was just originally just a singular cell in your life? And then that's all uh, become what we see in the world today, the diversity we see in the world today? The evidence indicates that it was simpler than that, and it, and it wasn't just one, that it was whole populations of them until they finally acquire all seven criteria to be qualified as life. And then from that, and we have the earliest prokaryote uh, fossils date back to like 3.77 billion, with a B, years ago, and we know that like people will argue about the Cambrian explosion because they don't understand that there was a point where two different organisms developed hard shells at the same time. Arthropods and mollusks both developed shells at the same time. So suddenly, you know, you know soft-bodied animals are very difficult to find. We can find them. We have found them. We've, we've got lots of pre-Cambrian life forms in the fossil record. But there was a huge plethora of them when they started developing shells because shells preserve very well. So back in Darwin's day, when they didn't know about microfossils and they hadn't explored very much, they just barely discovered what fossils were, they had a mystery as to why life stops there. But prior to that, there were no mammals a uh, hundred million years ago. There were maybe, no, no there, weren't, and there, were no uh, there were no birds 200 million years ago. There were, no, uh, there were no vertebrates at all 400 million years ago, period. So all we have, or yeah, they had chordates, but not yet vertebrates. So we know that all of these things develop sequentially, and that there's a point when you get back like five billion years ago where almost everything is soft-bodied or single-cellular. And when you get back like a billion years ago, they're all single-cellular. And so there's no correlation with the biblical story ever at all in anything. How did all this complexity, how did all this complexity and diversity of life happen? It's an emergent process. It's inevitable. When you talk about anything... Inevitable. Yes. When you talk about it, anything at the subcellular level, or the, the cellular level, or the molecular level, anything at the molecular level is going to be numbers that are, that are incomprehensible to our experience because you're using a different metric. And any pattern that you see, like, like, like this, if you, get, if you zoom in on any one of these things, you're not going to see this larger pattern. This is an emergent thing. You can't see this pattern unless you back up far enough to see it. That's what emergence is. So if you look at what, is, what makes up a human, you would, you would admit that we're all made of cells, but then if you look at the, the cells, you know that we're made of DNA. So if you look at the individual DNA, is that a human? No, DNA is not a human, but it isn't, that's what makes human. If you look at portions of genes, any gene, it's a human gene, but any one gene is not going to be, it's not going to be an example of everything else. That's what emergence is. You don't recognize it when it's zoomed in. You, we can only see it from back here. So how does life change? How do you see this emergence happening? Do you there accept are natural selection? I, I have to accept it since it's, been, since it's been proven, yes, since we've demonstrated it. And not just a few times in the lab. We've been demonstrating natural selection and artificial selection since we began agriculture. For thousands of years we've been doing this. Corn, for example, is a mutation of a grass called Tiacente. It's only got five genes difference. That means, essentially, five mutations to turn grass into corn. And look at the dramatic difference you see in that. And this was just people 
picking the grass. They're eating grass because they don't have anything better. So they're eating the, big, the, the bigger seeded grass, the, the tastier grass, and it doesn't take long, well, a thousand years, before they end up with something that is equivalent to corn. That's how evolution works. So you have populations, and in every population, there's little teeny differences. You have, on average, humans have 128 mutations per zygote. That's the ones we begin with. Now we have significant mutations that actually have an effect. Most mutations don't. You can have some detrimental ones. If you have some positive ones, those will have a selective benefit. It won't matter to you. You probably won't notice it. But over time, those benefits to you will be transferred down through your children and, and eventually flood the, the rest of the population. Very quickly, you can have people move from one population to another area, and in just a few generations, you'll recognize that the people in this other area are visibly distinct from the people in this area. The same with dogs and cattle, every other type of life form. Separate a, a colony of birds on a different islands, and over the course of generations, unique mutations appear in both sets so that these are different sets of birds. Never, ever, ever, ever in evolution has any has one kind of thing ever given birth to another fundamentally different kind of thing. That's another misrepresentation that creationism presents. That's a violation of two laws, the laws of biodiversity and the law of monophyly. monophyly. That's not what evolution teaches. When, when there's a new species of a fruit fly or a finch, people, creationists will say, but it's still a fly. Or it's still a well, of course it is. It has to be. That's the laws of evolution demand that. You cite the fact that macroevolution, they got examples, you said, uh, how many did you say? You said there's a dozen dozens. or so? Dozens. 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 Uh, I, uh, I can understand micro, of course I accept microevolution, ad adaptation, how all that happens. Microevolution and adaptation are not the same thing. And I can see the changes that you have. I can see how natural selection can make minor changes, but to make these wholesale changes. There's no such thing as a wholesale change. Over time, yeah, over the, in every, the, in every your emergence change. profile. I can, yes, yeah, every change, if, if I may, and I'm, I'm sorry I'm, if I'm stepping in on your words. No, I you step in on that, that evolutionary changes is incremental. Uh, it's superficial changes being slowly accumulating on top of, uh, of fundamental similarities, and those tiers of fundamental similarity identify their plates. So never ever is there wholesale changes, period. I understand according to evolution, it's just gradual changes. Like if you go to the, uh, the first man, then that, they would look just like their parents, basically. And they would look just like their parents. And they would- Technically, those, there's no first man. So you would say then there absolutely is no first man. Okay. Yeah, so, so just like there's not a first dachshund. If you had dog breeders and they produce bloodhounds out of, out of a, a, a feral like wolfhound, and then they get out of bloodhounds, they get basset hounds, and you can see these increments, and you get from basset hound to get to bloodhound. But these are still dealing with populations of puppies until we, get, we begin to recognize these general trends in the different breeds. So which one would you ever be able to point to and say that was the first dachshund? That well, you could, never yeah, I understand that would make total sense. But you can't find a first atom. You could not go to a first right. man. It would just blend all the way back to right. the universal. Now we can say that there is a genetic there's a genetic distinction that when it first appeared, you might be able to identify, okay, the first time we had this chromosomal fusion, what Kenneth Miller mentioned. And this is another point, point too. When the intelligent design theorists put out this wedge strategy where they wanted to misrepresent evolution until they fooled everybody until they got to this court case. They got the court case that they were predicting they were going to get. It was called Kitzmiller versus Dover. And it was a, a conservative Christian, Republican uh, judge. appointed judge that, that presided over that case. However, he was not biased. He didn't, he didn't rule on behalf of his religion. They showed that absolutely every single one of the testable claims made by intelligent design, without exception, all of them had already been disproved before they had a court case in science. And then they had to reveal and explain how those things were disproved in a court of law, and Kenneth Miller was a large part of that. He gave a, a brilliant explanation uh, about the, the chromosomal fusion, where we apes have uh, one more chromosome than we do, or one more pair of chromosomes than we do, because of the, we have 23, do they have 24? And so it's chimpanzee number two, and then another chromosome that we don't have, and they have precisely identified all the, in, all the indicative markers for how that chromosome happened. So we would have had a person who wouldn't have looked appreciably different than anybody else in his clan, but technically that mutation would have existed in the first individual. So if you want to really reach, you'd have to do a genetic test to find out which one was the first person, but it would have been just like looking at these people here. You wouldn't be able to know by, by looking at them externally. So you go to the uh, evidence for the chromosomal 
Chromosome 2 fusion, that, that's very interesting. I'd like to tell you a testimony about when reading Kenneth Miller's books. His first book was Finding Darwin's God, and he wrote that one. Then about the time we were on the board having our debate, he wrote Only a Theory. And in the Only a Theory, this is kind of personal testimony, was, I started reading his book. I remember sitting down upstairs in my home, reading through his book, and said, oh my gosh, am I on the... It was very compelling. Yeah, and at the point, at one point I sat there, I put the book down and I said, am I really on the correct side on these standards? And so I said, I'm going to check this out. So I checked it out and I said, how can he make such a compelling argument? And I just finished reading the chapter on uh, fossils and the fossil record. There's three major patterns in the fossil record. The first one is the sequential nature of groups in the fossil record. And I think that's, the, from my perspective, that is probably the strongest evidence that evolution has occurred, is the fact that if you look at the oldest rocks, they're simple life. As the rocks get younger, there's more complex life and more diversity. However, uh, there's two other patterns in the fossil record, which we've already alluded to today, and that's sudden appearance. When you find a certain organism, it's fully formed in the fossil record. And then the other is stasis. Stasis is the fact when you find it, it stays the same until it either disappears or it's still alive today. And uh, I remember reading Stephen Jay Gould. He uh, was the paleontologist, so he's the one that checked him, and he was one of the most influential evolution spokesmen. He always argued for the fact that uh, stasis is data. In fact, in one of his books, he said, stasis is data, stasis is data. Say it 10 times before breakfast, every day for a week. Let it sink in for osmosis sink in like osmosis. And his point was, uh, that's not what you expect to see in the fossil record. It stunned him and, uh, what, what's that? It's, it stunned him and, and his fellow researcher that they came up with the idea of uh, punctuated equilibrium to explain the fossil record because evidence, we're talking about evidence for evolution, the evidence in the fossil record did not support evolution. And it still doesn't. It, it, it certainly does. And comments that he had made back in 1974 have been well overturned by now. Okay, so he made he made the comment about how transitional species were excessively rare. But we've discovered more transitional species just in the last 30 or 40 years since than we had in the entire history of paleontology before that. It's I mean almost everything we found has been in the last few decades. So it's it's quite overwhelming. And he said that like in the same year that they discovered Lucy, which is coincidental. If it, if, maybe he said that in 77. He, he wrote Lucy it in later books, I know that. Well, he, he may have, but he, he's famous for that statement in 1977. But what he's talking about with this stasis and what punctuated equilibrium is, is when it, it takes that an organism that is going to be well suited to a stable environment is going to, per, is going to proliferate for a long time, at least in the skeleton that we're getting, right? But we know that the changes happen, as I said, uh, superficially, they start at the surface. So the differences between people aren't going to start at the bones. They're going to start at the skin level. So and, and generally, the differences between everything start at the surface and then become more integral. It's very rare that you get a fundamental change. When, when you're talking about something like the transition of, of uh, aquatic life onto land, what you're going to have is something that's not very well suited for either. Now, very quickly, you're going to have from that, you're going to have more advanced life forms stemming from that one, and then their older form that's still waddling and, can, and still and can't run because of diversity. Now we have some that can run; it can turn on their own progenitors. Now that transitional species doesn't doesn't procreate so well; it's at a disadvantage. And now these other things can speed on. So these occurrences, he argued, would not exist for a very long time, and you're not going to see most of the differences. Like if you were to get fossil snakes, you can get. Ten different fossils, you can get, not even fossils, get skeletons of different colubrid snakes in this country, get 12 of them, and compare them. You won't, if they're all colubrids, you're not going to tell whether it's a rat snake, a corn snake, or whatever, because all, all of the differences are at the surface. So that's the way evolution works, and so that's why it appears static in the, in the terms that he's talking about. We've also found a lot of transitional since then that he never even predicted. I'm sorry that he was dead before we started finding the really good ones. Okay. This brings up the fact. We talk about these transitionals that you say there's so many more today. My challenge for the evolutionists, and you can take this to heart and go back and, and come up with an article about this or a video. Now, this. probably. You probably could. But here's my argument I think there's a conceptual flaw, giant conceptual flaw in the evolutionists and the way they conceive 
how they conceptualize what's happened from the past and how to explain where we got here today. And that conceptual flaw is the fact they think they have a lot of evidence when they do not have a lot of evidence. I can prove that we have a lot of evidence. I can prove that to your satisfaction. Regardless what you want to believe and despite your faith, I can still prove it. Okay, I want to hear that in a second. Let me finish my no, you point. You won't have it in a second because this is going to be an education and we're not going to be able to do it here because I'm going to have to show you things in order for you to get you to understand it. But I can't do that. Because the reason they make these claims, and for instance, here, here's one I'd like to cons consider. Bone. Bone's been around since the pre-Cambrian days, I guess. No. Okay. Well, when did it first start? It, originally, everything that had a skeleton, when skeletons finally developed, they were carbon venous. Yeah, car so, cartilage, but then the cartilage, we ended up with some bone. Okay. So you end up in, and I think it's the Silurian, you finally start getting oste osteophytes. Okay, 300, 400, I don't know. Yeah. Instead of 500 years, million years ago, make it yeah. 300, 300, 400. 300, okay, somewhere back 300. Bone consists, uh, how, how, how do we get bone? What good when the first bone, it consists of collagen, fibers to make collagen it's uh, like 1400 it's got three strands of uh, fibers to make collagen makes it like a rope mm -hmm. it's formed inside a cell because everything has to be made inside a cell so when these so when it's when it's made it's like 1400 amino acids long to get it coated you're going to have to have three codons for every uh, amino acid that's coated once you get these then it has to somehow have special tags on the end so it can get out of the cell without, you know. No, no, no. Anyway, as they then develop, when the, as you they have the, the, the fibers of the bone, which is collagen, let's say you have it out inside the, the tissue, and then you're going to have to add the uh, osteoblast, osteoclast, like, all these different, art, that, you know, uh, cells. You need not collagen, you need calcium. And cartilaginous fish do develop calcium, not just during their life, but you can have a certain level of calcium. And so one of the one of the facts in evidence for evolution is that we have lineages of fish that have proportionately much less calcium in their skeleton so that they're much more cartilaginous because this was a slow development too. Changing cartilage into bone was a slow development, like polypterids, for example. Uh, they're, they're very primitive, lobe finned fish. We still have a few of them here. The, now, but what we have is about this look, it used to be 10 feet long. They have very low levels of calcium. It was, a, it was an overtime progression that made them harder to eat for other animals, or that made them stronger when they got larger. So what can, do you have any idea of the steps necessary to change, to change it? But let's yes, get back to just, the- as I said, you just have proportions. So even on a cartilaginous fish, you have a small be. proportion of calcium. And then in what we consider calcified or osteo, uh, osteo uh, fish, we, can't osteate these, uh, then you, you still have, you still have where it's not 100% calcium, it's still going to be some percentage of, of cartilage. So once you get a piece of bone, okay, uh, or a piece of cartilage, it doesn't do the organism any good unless Why? it's, until it's got something to move it around. If you're going to, bones have ligaments attached to it. They have So the you start with muscles, muscles and, and, and all of the, all of the framework is already connected to the muscle. So you have stable parts, the foundational part, this becomes the cartilage, and then later calcifies. Now if it calcifies with too much rigidity, then you're going to have to have hinges in there, and that's where we get vertebrae. So we are talking about very slow progressions from, from just from, How? How I just told you. So you have a possible, you have a population of fish, right? And they're, and they're going to have, they're all going to be variable. They're all, not all of them are exactly the same. And from these variations, you have some that have more calcium than others, and some their their calcium is segmented in a functional way. Some of them maybe not so much, because we've had how many steps would that take? Thousands. But we we have how many steps can you identify? Uh, that I personally identified, I think about twenty. But what we have is like we have fossils uh, that fossil fish that are would be functionless here. They're heavily armored but they wouldn't be able to survive in the, in the current environment because even though they're heavily armored, they're not very mobile because they've, they've cut down their own mobility. So we have, all through the fossil record, we have, we have animals that are basically defunct. They were only able to work in the, in the environment that they were in. When they, even, when they invented jaws, when, when the, the, the forward ribs connect through the gill bars and then they could move them with musculature to actually bite 
It was a soon it was a quick adaptation to teeth. And some of them had teeth even before they could get to this point. Big lab like Triconodons had teeth before they could get to that point. So that was when they just had lips with teeth on them, and now they've got bone to back it up. And once they could bite, the armored fish were, were doomed because we had things that could bite through even armor with huge shearing uh, blasts like giant scissors. To me, that sounds like a great just so story. How do you come up with Except this Except we know state? it's not that. We know it's not a story. We know that we're not just professing this. We know that we are following the evidence. Instead of dictating what we're going to find in advance, we can predict what we're going to find in advance, but we're not dictating it. We find the thing, and then it either confirms what we said, or it proves it and goes in a, disproves us and goes in a different direction. So we know for a fact these fish actually did exist, and all of them date back to this prior time. And we know what all the dates are, and there's many different ways of dating this. And what you've got for the 6,000-year-old Earth is one guy who couldn't do his math, what, 400 years ago, right, who figured out everything wrong. And I mean everything wrong. If you go back to 6,000 years, when did he think the flood was? 2300 BC, we know better than that, right? So we know none of that work. So the, your, your best ain't, ain't enough. And you're sitting here saying that the evidence for evolution is weak, that the foundation of modern biology is weak because you believe snakes can talk. Foundation of modern biology, I'm glad you brought that one up. How can evolution be the foundation of modern biology? If you go and, and I challenge anyone that's uh, listening right now, whatever, go to a biology department and ask about the biologists what would happen to what you're doing today if evolution if, wasn't true if evolution was not true would it change right. anything you're doing today? absolutely yes and I've already done that of course and the answer is yes it would change everything because the only reason we know how things work at all is because we know how they are evolutionarily related and how evolution works and that well, it really does work I have asked biologists that too and it won't make a, a bit of difference in what they say no okay. so chocolate no, oh, no thanks. Are you sure? Yes, sir. Eating enough chocolate will, will prevent or cure cavities. <laughs> thanks for the offer. No, I'm fine. I'm fine. Uh, I got... Uh, He's a dentist, so I had to ask him. Yeah, because, I like that. I like that. Because, uh, you know, then I can stand up to experts. So, I, I got another question. It's opportunity to be with Warren is kind of neat. Appreciate it, James, for getting us here. What... Uh, how do you explain the... Uh, human consciousness. The fact, you know, that's one of the great mysteries, it seems to me. I don't see, I don't see the mystery. I never have. Okay. Well, then you don't need to explain it. Well, no, I, I, I don't see why it's a mystery. Because I know how it developed. And, I, and it always confuses me how other people are confused at this. When they say, where did consciousness come from? But that's a stupid question. If you, def if you create a device that has some kind of sensory apparatus in some way to react to it, then that device is going to, in a sense, know when it runs into something and has to change direction, right? So we have, we have prokaryotes. We have like protozoans, for example. Uh, not, not prokaryotes, but eukaryotes. We have pro protozoans that can detect when they're being engulfed by an amoeba or whatever, and they will, they will react. They don't have any kind of uh, brain at all, but they have some awareness of their environment and they have some way to react to it. And this is entirely chemical and it's built into them. Same thing with slime molds. Slime mold, no kind of brain, no neurons whatsoever, but a slime mold can calculate its way through a maze with no thinking apparatus at all, just by having some ident just having some way to feel the environment and know what it is. So, and we don't even know how they know what it is because it has no brain at all. But the, the more the more senses you have, and we have a lot more than five or six. We have we have several. We have like, I think we're up to eighteen different senses we have. And when you have increased uh, brain size, the more complex neural network, the more awareness you have, not only of your environment, but also of your place in it. Whether you're in pain, whether you should run, whether you, whether you should, you know, uh, fight or flight responses. All of these indicate an amount of awareness. Your dog barks and runs in his sleep, indicating that there's thinking going on there. You know that the dog has consciousness. The dog certainly has an awareness of you and of him and, and of your relationship to each other. Now, when you get into social species like monkeys, who have all of the advantages, because not only do we have the social structure where we have to read body languages and cues and be able to communicate in some way, we can also bang rocks together. Unlike octopuses and dolphins and elephants, we can actually perform chemical experiments. We can make tools and use them. And all of these enhance our intelligence until we get to the point where we have the gray matter, which is the 10% of our brain that we use that ascends us above all of the other animals. Just that, that 10%. We use the other 90% too, but they're for motor functions and regulation and that sort of thing. So we've had consciousness since early primates, at least. So you didn't just blink, oh, I just woke up and I'm here. That didn't happen. 
So you, it's also just totally gradual process is the way you understand it? Of course. It. Well, I guess it'd have to be thinking assumptions you make. At the beginning. Assumptions? What did I assume? What did you assume? Yeah. That it's going to progress gradually. As how, am I, progress. how am I assuming That's a, that? How many, how, what do you mean, what assumptions have you made? You make giant assumptions. When did I make always, an assumption? That, that when you stated you have cells, and these cells uh, eventually are going to... Do they interact their, with their environment, like I said? Did I lie about that? Was that an assumption, or is that a fact? Uh, I'm talking about earlier on, about 15, 20 minutes ago, when you were talking about how the whole process of evolution is... Gratulation, you know, gradual. Yes, this is all indicated by evidence. This is not assumption. Well, give me the evidence. I just did. I gave, uh, one of the things that I gave you, and I want you to just acknowledge that maybe I gave you some evidence, but <laughs> the, the, the lineages of fish that we have that appear in the fossil record also have the morphology indicating that they're low fin fishes very close to the time of divergence, and yet their, their bones, and we can analyze in modern day fish, have very low degrees of calcium, just like we would predict. It is exactly what, what falls in line with evidence. Would you accept that, that that's a fact that? Evidence, by the way, just for clarification, is a body of objectively verifiable facts, which is a tautology. Facts are objectively verifiable anyway, at least if they're empirical, that, um, that positively indicate or exclusively concord with one available position or hypothesis over any other. You can't have the same evidence for two different mutually exclusive conclusions. It doesn't, the fact doesn't become evidence until it points to one of the, or eliminates the other. So, except. <clears throat> okay. Well, I have... Uh... For you, it, it's facts that are evidence. For, for me, it, I, I just don't see the same facts. What the do you same think evidence, evidence is, you, if not facts? Okay. For instance, the fossil record. Why are there? Uh, why, why is stasis the the it's fact a, that you see in the fossil record? You get around the. Uh, would we have to get into specifics on that? Because well, that's what I, I would like. You because, give I, me some I don't, because I don't see the specifics that you're talking about. What I don't, I'm looking at what, what Gould was talking about based on what he knew at his time versus what we know now. The stasis uh, thing we see in the fossil record today. Right, it's not the stasis that he made it out to be. Is, it, we, is we there stasis in have, the fossil record today? We don't have a point of stasis, of actual stasis, because we have things that are continuously evolving anyway. Well, that's your assumption. No, it's not an assumption. Yes, have, it is. No, no, it's not an assumption. It is an assumption. No, it is I not mean, an assumption. One of the longest, longest lasting species was like hyenodon. And it lasted for like five million years, which a single species doesn't usually last that long. We usually, which hyena don I don't remember, but individual species will constantly diverge. That's not an assumption. That's a demonstrated fact. These things will constantly diverge. We know that it's just like languages, right? Latin doesn't exist today anymore, right? But we know that Spanish, French, and Italian, uh, no, Spanish, French, and Romanian and later Portuguese all evolved from Latin, right? So they evolved through cladogenesis, so new groups separated from Latin, and they developed French, they developed Spanish in different places. And then Italian arose directly from Latin, replacing Latin, so that's, that's a, an evolutionary process called anagenesis. We know that this happens. Nobody speaks Latin anymore, and, and, and another 2,000 years from now, nobody's gonna be speaking French or, or Spanish. Those languages are gonna change too, because they always do. We're talking about evolution, not this language. To change the language, to change, well... Language, language is a beautiful analogy for how, how evolutionary changes happen at a population level, because nobody ever says that there was suddenly a, a first guy to speak French, and that he had to go wander around looking for another person to speak French to. We know that these things happen gradually over small increments, and that evolution happens the same way. Okay. You had demonstrated stasis in the fossil record. Is, is, why was it such a problem? Can you give me an evolutions? example of this demonstrated stasis that you're talking about? What I'm talking about is, I'm not as polished on the... Uh, well, that's why I said we needed to get into specifics, because I don't see it the way Gould did. Okay, I you see, disagree with I the way... I see constant fluidity. So when you look at the fossil record, you see... If, if Gould had dug up a whole bunch of colubrid snakes, he would say that they were all static, right? Some of them I rat have snakes, no gopher snakes... Pine snakes, we, they would actually all be different species, but he wouldn't be able to see that because he's only looking at the bones. And it takes too long for those changes to get down to the bones. So when you're looking at fossils, you're Okay, very... dinosaurs, the dinosaurs. I, I, I'm curious about... <coughs> we don't see dinosaurs walking on the earth. Yes, we do. You've eaten several of them. Chicken? Yes. Okay, okay, well, I... Uh... I know people say that the chickens are dinosaurs. I've, well, it's I've not been, just chickens, all birds. 
So yeah, you're going to say a bird is a, is a dinosaur? Is it, is it, is, yeah, they're, they're the sole survivor. That's just where the dinosaurs are today, that's what no, you that, mean. No, that's the, the last remaining line of them, yes. It's the birds. And there used to be more birds than we have now. There used to be, a lot, back in the Cretaceous, there were many different types of birds than currently exist. Major types, I don't mean like individual species, like major family uh, level categories <laughs> that all went extinct and only two or three survived the KT extinction out of all of the original ones we have. Okay, well let's go to, and so what's the most popular have shoulders? Fingers. They could still grasp, they were birds, they could still grasp with their fingers. The first transitional species we discovered was one that Darwin had predicted. He said that he realized that the modern birds had fingers that were fused together. And he said if they were, if they were descended of, of dinosaurs, then they should have unfused wing fingers. And then Archaeopteryx was discovered within, within two years. years. Yeah, yeah, within two years. Claws and everything. So now we, we still have, we found the hoaxin. So the hoaxin is one of those neotenous things where in its development, it, it, it still keeps its fingers with the, with the claws on them. And then, you know, following an evolutionary process called Evo Devo, it then absorbs those fingers back and then they become fused following an evolutionary pattern. Okay, let me get to a real specific. Do you have one more uh, kind of point that you okay. made before we have to go to Q&A? Oh, good. Well, here's my question. So my, can, can you reset my camera? Okay, thank you. Now, I, the, uh, there was pictures it has to of, reset uh, every 30 minutes. Uh, that I saw the other day of the osprey. It's hunting, and it's coming in. It showed the pictures of the talons and all that. I got it. Maybe I have it. Oh, here they are. Here's a series of pictures of the osprey. I don't know what you can see, um, but you see, here's a bird, big bird. He's got his eyes focused. He's ready to go fishing. Mm -hmm. He's got the talons out. He hits, he's got his wings folded back. You see these series of pictures. He's heading into the water. He's got to have eyes that can spot that. Look at that. It's just incredible. Series of pictures. He's heading straight into the water. Just a series of those. Just incredible. Yeah, there's a lineage of dinosaurs you should be aware of called para aves that are non avian dinosaurs that are indistinguishable from birds, or you can tell that. And then he gets the fish. Uh -huh. He gets the fish. He must have had an appetite for fish. Coming up with the fish. He takes the fish. The fish is aerodynamically, he's learned how to rotate the fish so he can flop with these giant wings to bring his fish up so he's turned the bird and when I look at nature I see all these things that seem totally unexplainable on whatever the phrase you used at the beginning where you described how these gradual, you know, these gradual processes of how a bird became an osprey with the eyesight the desire to get the fish to see the fish to dive in with those talons just like that sharp as can be and, uh, so earlier velociraptors had all of those features, and they, so also, just, and they also had feathers on top of that. Okay. When you watched Jurassic Park, you wouldn't know, because when they made that movie, they didn't know that, that velociraptors were actually fully feathered, full-on plumage. They were so, virtually indistinguishable from birds. They were in a class of dinosaurs called para -A. So you're of the position that that osprey that I just showed this amazing ability, just yeah. Just that's happened. That's a velociraptor. That's just more refined. Just a, okay. Interesting. I, yeah, find, I at, find that explanation if you look incredibly at weak. If, if you I have to look at that and to see. I can show you a sequence. to see that God created an osprey. I, I can show that. you a sequence of para -aids. I can show you a, a, a chronological sequence of para -aids where you will not what make eggs? para -aids. What para -aids. para -aids. Where you will not be able to say, when it stopped being a dinosaur and became a bird. They, they, it's always a dinosaur. It's still a dinosaur. That bird is still a dinosaur. It just at one point, it wasn't yet a bird. And we can't to tell. You, you wouldn't be able to tell. Looking at the sequence of parades to, to early primitive birds, you wouldn't be able to tell which I'm one. I'm not sure what a parade is. It's a dinosaur that is virtually indistinguishable from birds. It's that with a slightly longer tail in most cases. It's that exact thing. Well, I find that pretty hard to accept. Well, then look at the fossils. I can show them to you. They don't all have beaks. Some non-avian dinosaurs did have beaks. Some in the parades had beaks that were clearly not birds. But then there's others, like um, 
called Ipsteryx zooey, where the scientists can't identify, is this still just a non-avian dinosaur, because it still has a little bit more tail than modern birds do. It still has fingers, like primitive birds did. It has all of the transitional features that early birds have, and that the periates have, and that there's no place where they, Codipteryx zooey, for example, is like, I don't know. Okay. Is it a bird? Is it a dinosaur? It's, well, it's clearly a dinosaur. They're all dinosaurs. But is it yet a bird? We don't know. All right. Okay. I, I find that un... I'd be delighted to show you the sequence. It's very impressive. Well, I'm going to have to do that one day. It should be soon. It should be 10 years ago. There's, just think that that bird, go catch those fish. Just think about that. That early raptor could do the same thing, even before it could fly. And it had wings before it could fly. And the creationists like to argue that there's no such thing as a half wing, but we've got lots of periods that have half wings. And the reason that they do is because these, these wings not only work for sexual displays, but they also help incubate a larger clutch of eggs, which is a profound selective pressure in natural selection. So that allows wings to develop. And these smaller ones could use these wings to run up trees. I've shown that with, with, with flightless birds. They can use their wings to run straight up a tree. As long as they got their claws on there, they have enough lift. And then it's just a literal hop to going into flight. And then one of the best, best transitional species ever discovered was one that was originally considered a fraud. There was a guy who unwisely bought an illegal fossil in China, and he named it Archaeoraptor. He showed it to a number of scientists. Everybody told him, this is a fraud. This is two, this is two fossils put together. Every scientist that saw it said that. But he, he managed to, to get it into, into like National Geographic or something anyway, despite all the scientists operating. But one of those two fossils that were fused together was from an early raptor called Microraptor, which was actually predicted in 1903 uh, under the name of Tetractrix. It's a precursor to Archaeopteryx. It had four wings. It had wings on the front arms and wings on the back arms, both reduced, but able to use all of them for gliding. We will go into the Q&A portion if you both are ready. Thank you very much for a really interesting and civil discussion. <laughs> this is excellent. We've really appreciated how friendly these guys are. And we'll be switching back and forth as we go from, if anyone in the uh, live audience, anybody here in the building, if you have questions, you're more than welcome to ask. And otherwise, I'm going to jump into the questions that we have here from the online audience. So thanks for your questions, folks. Glad to have you here. And with that, First, we do have Bothell Guy. Thanks for your question. They said, can he provide any good evidence for God? So I think that they're kind of getting at kind of the, maybe the foundation of your case is that there is a God. And so more broadly, is there evidence for a God as they're asking? Well, I think I can. I, it satisfies me. The first one is, uh, and I know Aaron, RN doesn't uh, subscribe to the fact that it's either God or nothing. But I take, oh, one second. Well, oh, here it is, here it is. I have it right here. I've always been amazed at the uh, argument. There's Lawrence Krauss is a cosmologist, and he would talk about, he had a book out in the last 15, 20 years, A Universe from Nothing. And in the book, uh, he, he says you can get a universe out of nothing. Well, I like the old argument that uh, nothing, if you define nothing correctly, you're not going to get a universe out of it. And here's a special little rock. And I take the rock and I'll look at that and say, let's let it go to sleep. Let's put it to sleep. Oh, look at that. Now it's dreaming. Well, whatever this rock is, can't sleep and it's dreaming, you're not going to get a universe out of true nothing. And for me, it's either God or nothing leaves only one real choice, God. If God has no competitor but nothing, he's got nothing for a competitor. Except that no evolutionist believes that everything came from nothing, not even Lawrence Krauss. Krauss, in his book, A Universe from Nothing, he, really, he admitted that he was being rather tongue-in-cheek in the title, that he was talking about in, in a quantum vacuum, you would still have particle fluctuations of, of subatomic particles popping in and out of existence. But he said he would have to redefine nothing for that to be true. Nobody, he doesn't even believe that an absolute nothing is even possible to exist. So we can't believe that everything came from nothing if we don't believe there was ever nothing. That's exactly the point I'm making. Find out what nothing really is. Define it correctly as what a sleeping rock dreams of, and you're not going to get anything out of that. Did so you either have what a sleeping rock dreams of, or God, 
the question was, that supports the best answer for what I consider is God. Okay. And then the second one is the statement. I'll start off with a word, then I'll go to a statement. The statement is, there is no truth. Is, is that an accurate statement? No. The truth is what the facts are, the things I've been showing you all day. So, the statement, there is no truth, is an, what I'm saying is, it's an illogical, self-defeating statement. You can't say, you can't make a truth claim and say there is no truth. But the claim truth exists, the opposite, you can make that claim. And if you make that claim, then there has to be, from my perspective, a truth giver. Therefore, if you want to know why I believe God exists, that something was the question. That's, that's number one, I'll go to a word, nothing, God or nothing, nothing for a competitor, or a statement, there is no truth, versus the truth exists. So, that's my answer for why I accept the fact that God exists. It's not a fact. A fact is a point of observable data that can be verified. It is not an observable fact that God exists. It is an observable fact that there is no truth to any religion. We can state that, and that is a fact, because that is verified. Neither your religion nor any other can produce an actual fact. And the fact that you're representing it with the argument you just gave proves my point. We will jump to the next question. I'm sorry, I've got one more thing. If God existed, Evolution would still be an inescapable fact of population genetics, and the Bible would still be man-made mythology. It's still wrong. The Bible, it would still be wrong, and not even the existence of God could change that. It's not a choice between God or nothing. We don't have nothing. Nothing's not an option. We have reality, and you want to, you want to add a God to it. You just have to show to, uh, justification to add the God. Just to keep going with the Q&A, we've got to ask the next question. Thank you, though. Next, we do have a question from Jay Shy, who, by the way, I want to give credit to Jay as he helped us set up this debate. So thanks, Jay Shy, and thanks for your question. They said, to both, what are your thoughts on Christian organizations like BioLogos defending evolution and using scholars to show how Genesis is not in conflict with science? So we can start with Dr. Oh, McLeroy. Well, I, I have no problem with the people that are theists. I disagree with their take on uh, you know, supporting evolution, but uh, they're theistic evolutionists. We see things different. But I appreciate the fact that they appreciate that uh, there is, uh, that God exists, that the Bible, they support the Bible, that they support all the, uh, the fact that uh, Christianity, they support Christianity, and they're very important about the main message of Christianity. And the main Christian, they share with us the fact that Jesus was God himself that came. I know there are in this Again, that's not a fact. That. That's an assumption. That, uh, one that is not even borne out by your scripture. Uh, I'll pass it on. I have no problem with biologists. You bet. Thanks so much. And are on the floor is yours answer the same question. Yeah, yeah. for me, it, it, many of the, the pioneers of evolution, and indeed its champions yes. in the modern day, are Christian scientists. There are scientists who happen to be Christian. I've spoken with many of them. I've gotten some. They're even quoted in my book as saying that they're, they're not going to be dogmatic literalists. They know that things like, oh, Noah's Ark didn't really happen. And if you're going to try to defend all that, you're just going to get into the weeds and get away from the truth. Like Francis Collins was saying, you can't believe in the mythology and have that confuse what the reality is. We can demonstrate the reality. We don't, and, and everything else is just a matter of faith. That's what you, what, that's what you believe when you don't have the evidence to indicate that. We're going to jump into the next question. I do want to make a quick note, though, and say I thanked Artistic Encounter before for being our generous host. want to let you know I did put their address in the description box. So as I mentioned, if you're considering a tattoo, check out Artistic Encounter. I can vouch for them. I've got to meet the people here. They're very friendly, terrific people. So we highly encourage you to swing on by and get to meet them yourselves. And that's right here in Deep Ellum in Dallas. Okay, next, I also want to mention, tomorrow we will have good friend of R.N. Raw's, Hent Hovind, on debating <laughs> Professor Dave on uh, creation <laughs> evolution again. I appreciate you have a good sense of humor. Okay, so uh, that will be, uh, that's linked in the description for this video, so that will be another fun debate coming up. And next question, thanks for your question, uh, question from God's servant. They asked, can Mr. Arn Ra provide an example of gain of information mutation? Yes. If you want to look at my video on the phylogeny challenge, you'll get twofold there. There's, there's, uh, there's citations for 
uh, genetic mutations that do produce a, uh, a, an add or a gain in, in information. And also, in addition to that, there's the death knell of creationism. Creationism argues that all of these different species were created separately. If that were actually true, or if there was any fun, uh, true at all, and if there was any fundamental flaw in evolution either way, then the creationist would have to be able to answer the phylogeny challenge. There's a handful of yes or no questions there. Just let me know where the answer is no and what your reason for that is. Nobody can do it. Somebody tried to come up with baromenology to come up with the origin of these created kinds. They can't because every, or, every set of organisms belongs to a parent organism. That's the problem Carolus Linnaeus had when he, when he started systematic classification of life, when he wrote Systema Naturae. He was, a, he was a creationist. He was expecting to find examples of created kinds. But all of them were in parent categories, which are themselves in larger parent categories, and then collectively larger and fewer parent categories until they're all included in life. And that was a pattern that matches evolution, which he didn't know anything about because he lived 100 years before Darwin, but he could not explain it, and he challenged the scientific community of his day. He said he could not tell the difference between man and ape. There is no, there is no category difference that would fit phylogeny, and he demanded that they come up with an answer for that. What they did was arbitrarily construct a separate category for Kong Pongo, wherein they put all the apes except us. And if you, make, if you realize that it's all of them except for us, well, that's a Freudian slip already. And now we have the genetics to come back to say that, no, we are one among them. We are apes. We didn't just come from monkeys. We are monkeys right now. Gotcha. Thanks so much. Next up, we have time for just a couple more questions. We want to be kind of quick. So we do have one as well from Michael, the Canadian atheist. Glad to hear from you, Michael. They asked for Dr. M, if creationism is true, why is the entire real scientific community against it? That's a good question. I'm not exactly sure why a lot of scientists would be against it, but I'm do, uh, there, there's a wonderful book called Wonderful Life by uh, Stephen Jay Gould where he talks about the bandwagon effect in science and they can get on a bandwagon. Uh, what bothers me is they, uh, and even uh, Jerry Coyne, who's with wrote Why Evolution is True, he, he had a statement on an interview with PBS one day where he stated that not even evolutionists know exactly uh, everything. I think there's a bandwagon effect, effect in uh, scientists that are just going to accept evolution. Uh, so. That, that's all I can say. I, I don't know. I think they need to take a step back and look at it again. Yeah, there's a there's a bumper sticker that's been applied to me that uh, said on a statement I made in a blog post back in the day that science doesn't know everything, religion doesn't know anything. Because what science knows, we know and we can prove it. And what religion knows, they just made up. Next question from Brian Stevens. Thanks for your question. He asked. This is for Aaron, a personal question. He said, when will Aaron make his beer available to the public? I didn't brew that myself. Somebody else brewed that for me and then promised he would have another couple of cases soon and then never heard from him again and it's been a year. So if you're a brewmaster and you, and you know how to make a really stoked imperial stout, come talk to me. I'd like to work with you. Excellent. Thank you very much. I'm looking forward to that. And folks, thank you very much for tuning in today. It's been a lot of fun. And as we've said before, we hope you know whether you have a creationist position, evolution position, no matter what walk of life you come from, we hope you feel welcome here at Modern Day Debate. Keep sifting out the reasonable from the unreasonable. And just want to say one last thank you to our guests for being with us today. Thank you very much, gentlemen. Thank you. Yeah, I want to thank you as well for, for, your, for your demeanor. I know that I was not in kind, but that's just me. Passion. That's, we appreciate the yeah, passion. I like the passion. I do like the passion. It's, uh, so with that, thanks everybody for tuning in. Take care and have a great rest of your day. You're a good man. I'll keep studying. <laughs> keep studying. All right, well, and thank you, and seriously, and this is in all sincerity, I really can prove evolution to your satisfaction if you're up to it. And I'd be delighted to that do that. That bird, you said that's a dinosaur. <laughs> yep, and, so, and I can show you how we can prove that. Huh? I can show you how hey, we can prove yeah. that. Thanks so much. Well, that's pretty amazing to me. Matter of fact, it's in this book.
table, which I'd like to autograph and give to you. Oh, I'll take it. Put a leaf or a... All right. Anybody got a pen? Yeah. Preferably a Sharpie. Yeah, I got a pen. Very good. I'll take your book. I'll read it, too. I got every... I got so many books.